pain. Right. We all have this. De this is the definition we go by. Basically, it says pain is what a patient says it is, i.e. described in terms of tissue damage, noxious or otherwise. So it does encompass pretty much everything, whether it's there or not, whether we can see it or not. If the patient says it is, we have to believe them. This is quite helpful just for us to recap, and I do quite like this slide because it goes through nociceptive, inflammatory, neuropathic, and at the bottom, psychogenic, which I'm not sure I completely believe in because I think year on year as our modalities of imaging get better, we realise that there was early inflammation and the patient wasn't making it up. In fact, perhaps we should have believed them earlier. So I'm not so happy about psychogenic, but the others certainly, <coughs> definitely, they are helpful. Nociception describes pain. Obviously, in inflammation, nociceptive pathways are activated, and we will talk a little bit about those. And of course, neuropathic pain is important to recognise because increasingly we've got agents for neuropathic pain. And I think also the understanding that these can coexist is, is also very important to our practice these days. So, a useful classification, just, just if anything, just to sort of get your head around that. You don't that. give any importance to the site. Sorry? You don't no, 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 no. I, the, that, that definition there that we've got there actually says that it's caused by the mental processes of the sufferer. And I think they're intrinsically linked, but I'm not sure that one could, could categorically use the word causality or caused by. It's certainly exacerbated. Oh, it certainly is exacerbated. And we, of course, with pain management programs and understanding the psyche, it's vital. But to say it's purely caused by some sort of upper neuron or cerebral dysfunction, I think, I think you know, we're probably labelling people wrongly, possibly. Anyway, that's for debate, I guess. Um, this is my slide about what hurts and why. Um, obviously, we're well aware of, you know, through, through histology and C-fibres and A-delta fibres, etc., why things hurt. And clearly, bone, when it comes to tumours and things like um, uh, TB and where you get osteoporotic collapse, yes, bone does hurt, particularly when the periosteum is, is breached. Joints, similarly, RA, OA, yes, we know about these things, but it's a little more complex when it comes to muscles and tendons and what's actually going on. Um, we originally thought that muscles didn't have much in the way of, of, of polymodal nociceptors or C-fibres. We now realise with chronic damage, particularly overuse injuries, is that histologically there are changes and you get quite a lot of the appearance of what it seems to be these polymodal or, or, or these, these C-fibres which can transmit pain and they can grow. In other words, muscle can grow new pain fibres that weren't previously there. And particularly with chronic overuse syndromes, we may see this, leading to things like myofascial pain syndromes. The ligaments in a similar manner, again, acute tendinopathies and chronic tendinopathies, are very with chronic tendinopathies, obviously the matrix that's laid down, the, sort of the, 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 the collagen fibres sort of go from a type 1 to 3, and, they, and the type 3 is associated again with, again, polymodal C fibre growth, and it's also associated with A delta fibres, and these are important in the transmission and the generation of pain. So I think it's important to realise that with injury, and particular types of injury, chronicity of injury, overuse, particularly in sports people, is we can genuinely actually stir things up to a point that you end up with a situation where things sh become more painful than they should do. And, and this is what we try and do, is, is understand this, break the cycle, and try and reduce it to, again, normal physiological as opposed to pathological pain levels. Again, this is just a quick slide. I know there's an awful lot of stuff there. Calcitonin gene-related peptide and, and, and tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukins. And basically, this is just saying that with low-level inflammation, with repetitive muscle, over, if you get, if everything, the conditions are right, you are going to end up with this taking place, central sensitization and chronic pain developing, or the potential for chronic pain developing. So these are, this is what we now understand can happen, and this is possibly why pain persists. And hopefully in the end we'll talk about solutions, but you know, obviously we need to understand more about what's going on. Again, this is helpful just for your definition, and of course we tend to use this as a rough guide, and, and interestingly in, in chronic pain, we no longer see that the causative event is often it's uncoupled. Um, the intensity no longer correlates with the stimulus, or it, you know the stimulus doesn't seem to be there, yet the pain is. And, and people do say it becomes a disease in its own right, but I think if it has a strong musculoskeletal cause, and there's causality there, we can then assign it to that. Um, I think also quite important is there does come a time in, in, in sort of these 
very, very long-standing pain patients as where you know, it no longer becomes a useful warning function. The pain is just un uncoupled completely from, from the patient. I quite like this slide. Sarah, you've got yeah, Sorry, it's cut off the bottom of the London Orthopaedic Clinic. Um, that's fine. Um, and it, 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 this is really for me just to think about and it's a topic which I'm sure we all ask ourselves about anti-inflammatories. And this is just the inflammatory cycle. These are our basophils releasing sort of their, what they do. And, and I think about inflammation and is inflammation important or isn't it? And I think the debate rages on and on. And we know from certainly complex bone injury that, that non steroidals really we should avoid them at all costs. And, and when it comes to actually bony repair, although we've extrapolated this in, in, in mice and they've looked at things like diclofenac or typical non steroidals in, in animal models in terms of does it actually slow down repair, does it alter repair, or is repair somehow not right? We've not been able to demonstrate it in humans, but I think the learning or, or the lessons to take away from anti-inflammatories are possibly the least amount for the shortest time possible, really, because probably inflammation is important, because it, it, it does actually, it kicks off. That cascade, that early cascade, is quite important in sort of laying down the early repair and remodeling of, of tissue. So. It's a question, you know, it is debate, it's a debate, you know, there are certain people say you've got to get it in early, other people say not, and it's difficult to find the answers, to be honest. This is just to help us understand what's going on with inflammation and why things hurt. Obviously, these mediators here and this activation of the arachidonic acid pathway, this is obviously where non steroidals will work. And, and what happens to peripheral nociceptors? And the next slide is a great animated slide of, and I really like this, I didn't do this, so I have to let you know, because it takes far too long to animate these slides. All this is saying that in the presence of tissue injury, COX-2, which is cyclooxygenase 2, is expressed, which obviously affects prostaglandin E2, and then on the endoplasmic reticulum, it undergoes phosphorylation, all right? And at this receptor, this sodium receptor, we get membrane polarization. Basically, it's saying we get hyperexcitable membranes in the presence of chronic inflammation or inflammation. So membranes are hyperexcitable. I think what's important to remember is that the same thing applies in a neuropathic pain state, is this membrane hyperexcitability is very important for us, particularly when we're looking at novel drug targets. And it's important for us to look at this because this is where a lot of the pharma industry focus their attention on. If we can get membranes to behave more physiologically, then the pain should in turn follow. Again, this is just, I'm going to whistle th through this because we have got a lot to cover through and we've got, this is in your handout. This basically says very similar things about inflammatory pain, 5-HT nitric oxide, activation of the same pathways. But in addition to the peripheral, you've now got central sensitization which takes place. And I think that's very, very important in any long-standing or neuropathic pain state is that you do have not only real uh, histological changes taking place, but there are also biochemical and neuropeptide changes which take place with disinhibitory pathways which are affected by the same process. Again, this is just for your take home. What does this all mean? Typical primary nociceptive, typically neuropathic. For example, OA would be primarily nociceptive. Primary nociceptive would be things like posthepatic neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia. But I think what's really important is the sort of Venn diagram with the overlap is there can be overlap with everything, all right? And in certainly any back pain which is long-standing, I would expect there to be an element of neuropathic pain, even if it's local, because the nerves caught up in the inflammatory process will behave like neuropathic nerves with membrane hyperexcitability. And it's up to us to sort of use, use measures and manoeuvres to reduce this. Why does pain persist? We don't really know. We've looked at types of injury severity. Certainly chronicity and, and overuse injuries may lend themselves towards it, but not in everyone. So there's obviously a, a, a genetic basis and certainly there are some new studies coming out suggesting that there are specific alleles for the development of pain after injury. So I think it, it, a lot is, is actually predetermined and there's not much we can do about it. How big is the problem? Yes, it's big, all right? And this, this is really what we're looking at in terms of who's affected by what. Joint pain, back pain, neck arthritis, that's the overall 71% of severe pain due to back pain followed by joint pain. All right, that's sort of UK and European-wide statistics. 
Injury and muscle function. This is the part that I like. All right? This is the part I like because I like to talk to those people who are involved with uh, exercise therapy in terms of what's going on with muscles and, and why muscles don't work when you've got pain. When you've got nociceptor activation, things happen at the brain. And the next slide we'll come on to will actually show these changes, these sort of cortical changes which take place. But I think what's important is to realise that muscle adjacent to damaged muscle or underlying inflammation behaves differently. All right? And so it, 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 it sends signals upwards differently and it behaves differently. And I think what's quite important is this concept of pain inhibition. And I think this really is the slide I'm talking to. Sensory motor changes in low back pain. Um, I remember when I first put this slide up, it took me ages to get my head around an audience. I thought I understood it, and I couldn't talk my way around it, but I can now. What it says is basically on the top right is that in the presence of injury, let me just go back one step, I apologise. Right, this is the brain. This is the cortical, basically, you know, motor planning. This is where we think things and we plan things, and this is what happens. Muscle contraction at the bottom. So we've got brain outside of brain. And what we've got is, in the presence of some sort of injury or nociceptive input, <laughs> this doesn't work so well. So we get cortical inhibition, delayed central transmission, we get reflex inhibition, and also at this, between motor command and muscle firing, we can still get inhibition directly from the nociceptive cause. So when you've got pain, you sometimes can't actually get the muscle to do what they're supposed to do. All right? Um, this side of, of the map, or this side of the diagram, really demonstrates that it is absolutely vital for the brain to maintain its map of us <laughs> is to have a correct proprioceptive input coming in. So the proprioceptive input has to be correct and present so that this thing starts to work better. Obviously tweaking this is not always easy and getting it right is not always easy but that's why sort of in conjunction with getting the analgesics right or getting the blocks on board or getting the physio right or timing it correctly can make this work better, all right? But it sometimes doesn't work so bad. Why do we not always get it right? Well, I think most musculoskeletal pains are quite notoriously difficult to diagnose because there's considerable overlap. Uh, you know, is it partly tendon? Is there this much ligament involved? And how much is muscular? And, and there's not much bony? And is this disc? And and, and uh, uh, those problems, obviously, or those, 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 those very real things will obviously cause us grief, and, and that's why lots of patients do bounce around, because we don't always get it right first time. And this obviously is, 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 is who manages musculoskeletal pain. It can be, you know, any one of the above, and probably all of the above, managing it very well in their own context. So, you know, it's, it is important to realise that depending on who you see, the therapies will differ enormously. What can we do? We can obviously, if we can identify a problem, we can limit it, restrict it. Um, we can address any issues, and certainly things that we like to do. We like to use a multimodal approach. I like to think of myself as being fairly holistic and not just jabbing needles into everyone. Um, diagnoses. Um, again, I think we, we rely very heavily on certain things like MRIs and positional MRIs now. Um, increasing the musculoskeletal ultrasound is, is gaining um, favour, and particularly I know lots of exercise and physiotherapists are actually trained or training up in, 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 in ultrasound uh, as an aid to diagnosis and treatment. And I think what's quite important about all of these things is if, if, you, if you're looking from a musculoskeletal slant, it's very important to, to, to actually ask the correct questions of the person reporting. Um, you know, if, 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 if it's an MRI scan and you think you've got a musculoskeletal disorder, particularly spinal, it's important to state why you think it might be off. You know, if you're looking for a nerve root, it's quite obvious. You know, they, they, they are obviously, they, they're usually more obvious than the small subtle things which can do, do with atrophy of the, you know, atrophy of multifidus, you know, muscles not working, fatty infiltrations, or subtle things. And I think it's important to ask. Um, we obviously, you know, when we get down to this, we, we definitely are, are, you know, uh, by the time they reach me, I think most, <laughs> most people have had their turn. But I think what's quite useful is selective nerve blockade. We can, I can, certainly most pain clinicians who can inject, can actually switch groups of muscles or groups of areas or dermatomal segments or spinal segments. We can switch them on and off. We can block them, we can attenuate them, and we can do all sorts of things, which can help give us information about the diagnosis. So there are things that can be done. Again, just in summary, management strategies biomedical, and of course we mustn't forget psychosocial, all right? That's really important, okay? Um, this is my slide about why serial management doesn't work, and I think it's really important that we should try and
pool resources and try and get things working together. This is just a typical example of you've, you've got pain, you go and see someone, you have a couple of tests, you have a bit of physiotherapy, you don't get better, you have more investigations, you have a different in intervention. This is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being critical of this, I'm just saying this is just typically how we tend to do things and perhaps it might be useful to tie things together like he does. There's Gustavo Dudamel from Venezuela Orchestra. I just read up on him before I did this talk and he's now director in LA, Gothenburg and Venezuela at the same time. So he gets about this chap, okay, and he, he does amazing things. Um, it's really about multimodal treatment. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes when these patients are complex, you do need to actually, it's collaborative, you know, physio plus other doctor plus whatever. Um, and this is just reassuring for me that this study showed that most physicians believe that most physicians prescribing drugs alone will use combinations of antidepressants, anticonvulsants, NSAIDs, etc. So uh, it's useful to realise that people are not using monotherapy alone because that's not particularly not viewed these days as being the right way to do it. This is merely, again, for your benefit. Obviously, as the pain gets worse, we up the doses of what we use. These are conventional analgesics. You've all had patients on them. And these are what we call unconventional, or shall we say other, not necessarily analgesics. And interestingly, these are all membrane stabilizers to some extent, right? and that's what they do. Right? They stabilize and change membrane permeability, and they make the uh, the nervous system a little more stable. Um, I just need to put this in for completeness sake. There are weird and wonderful things that people use. Um, I'm particularly interested at the moment in these capsaicin patches, um, these topical, very strongly cutensa patch, which you can apply for peripheral neuropathic pain in sort of dermatomal areas. It can be quite useful uh, for patients who want to avoid over-medicating on things like pregabalin and gabapentin. So um, just to let you know again that you know these, these are often used... Um, Again, for, for different clinicians. I, I don't use any of them apart from the patch. <laughs> um, in terms of interventional treatment, and really I've got probably two minutes to go, and I just want to say that we pretty much, people have injected, let's go back, anything anywhere from sort of intraarticular to intrasheath to bursa, uh, and obviously local infiltration to muscle, subcutaneous tissue, and obviously in and around the spine, but you're going to possibly talk about that maybe. <laughs> So we'll leave that to you. And what do we inject? Obviously, we go from dry needling, right, the way to uh, platelet-rich therapy to prolotherapy. So there's a variety, again, of things which are injected. Uh, and you'll get your proponents, and you'll get your opponents of, of, of all sorts of things. Um, corticosteroid probably is what the bulk of most people do, and they continue to use. Are they the answer? No. Uh, and I guess you have to be very circumspect when using these things, particularly long-term. I think they're not a good idea long term and I think you constantly have to review patients as to why you're doing it. I think they're very useful short term sometimes to actually buy yourself a little bit of time or buy yourself more effective time, more effective physio and it goes back to the muscle inhibition again. You know, If you can actually get more effective physiotherapy perhaps you won't ever need to have this again. Let's not forget psychosocial because I'm a holistic doctor. All right. Explanation avoiding figure CBT mindfulness. Has anyone come across mindfulness in terms of how yes. we use it? Yes? Do you use it? Brilliant. Mindfulness is great. You, instead of running away from the pain, you turn around, you face it head on, and you say, I acknowledge you, and we're going we're gonna to live together. So it's learning to coexist with something. It's, it's, it comes from meditation, and for some people, it's really, really helpful. PMP stands for Pain Management Programs, all right, which um, John's exercise program is not a pain management program, but obviously rehabilitation programs address some of the issues. So, that's my summary, really. This is what we should be doing. Medically optimising and giving people mind-altering physio. All right. So, in summary, it's multifactorial. Titrate analgesia against response. Find out what's useful in terms of interventions. Use them, if necessary, repeatedly. Um, address psychosocial issues, because I think there often are there. Uh, and keep moving. All right. I'm saying the pro proprioceptive remodelling, I think, is, is, is key to getting people back to fitness, back to normal, and back to feeling themselves again.